you can begin. Okay. So let's start with um, the opening prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Come by means of the powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, your well-beloved spouse. Come, Holy Spirit. Come by means of the powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, your well-beloved spouse. Come, Holy Spirit. Come by means of the powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, your well-beloved spouse. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So welcome, everyone. Um, thank you all for having me here. Um, I'm delighted to be here with you all. I thank um, Benjamin for inviting me to be here with you on these two days, um, day 24 and day 25. Day 24 is about knowledge of Mary. And the theme is, we can trust Our Lady with all we have, both material and spiritual. And, you know, the saints had great love for the Blessed Virgin Mary. You know, she was the secret of the saints. Our Lady never impedes us. It's never an obstacle um, to Jesus. But she is the one that helps us to love Jesus, to grow in love for Jesus, her son. And the lives of the saints teach us this. She is the mediatrix of all graces. And the final aim of consecration to Mary is always to belong better to Jesus. Jesus is the final aim of consecration to Mary. But St. Maximilian Kolbe teaches that the most efficacious way of arriving at union with Jesus is through the Blessed Virgin Mary. And the saints teach us that just as Jesus came to us through Mary, God the Father wants that we go to Jesus through Mary. And one can go to Jesus directly. I mean, obviously, we pray to Jesus, we you know, speak to Jesus, we give ourselves to Jesus. Okay, we want to belong totally to Jesus. But it's a more humble way to do it with the assistance of his heavenly mother, who Jesus gave to us from the foot of the cross. So I say um, a, a more humble way because if we know how weak we are, okay, we know how much we are in need of God's grace, of God's mercy, okay, um, and how much we need help. If we recognize this, we would want to use every means at our disposal okay, to arrive at where God wants us all to be, and that is holiness, sanctity. God is calling each and every single one of us to become saints. He wants us to be holy. So the Blessed Virgin Mary is like that ladder. She is a teacher. Okay. And if we become little and small, because remember Jesus said we cannot enter the kingdom of heaven unless we are like little children. If we become little and small, holding the hand of our mother, she will lead us to Jesus. But if we think that we are self-sufficient and we've already grown and mature in the spiritual life and we don't have any need of any assistance, we don't have any need from the Blessed Virgin Mary, it will be very difficult. It will be very difficult. And let us remember the Blessed Virgin Mary is the one who crushes the head of the serpent. Okay? She is the one who crushes the head of the serpent. So let us remember the prophecy of Genesis 3.15. When God spoke to the serpent, he said, I will put enmities between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. She will crush your head, God said to the serpent. Okay. And 
in um in in a fabulous deus which is where the um the dogma of the immaculate conception um, was proclaimed by pope pius the the ninth we read that the ecclesiastical writers in interpreting the prophecy of Genesis 3.15, where it says, I will put enmities between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, thought that by this divine prophecy, the merciful redeemer of mankind, Jesus Christ, the only begotten son of God, was clearly foretold that his most blessed mother, the Virgin Mary, was prophetically indicated. And at the same time, the very enmity of both against the evil one was significantly expressed. Hence, just as Christ, the mediator between God and man, assumed human nature, blotted the handwriting of the decree that stood against us and fastened it triumphantly to the cross, so the Most Holy Virgin, united with him by a most intimate and indissoluble bond, was with him and through him, eternally at enmity with the evil serpent and most completely triumphed over him and thus crushed his head with her immaculate foot. So the Blessed Virgin Mary will help us to triumph. She will triumph in us and through us. But we have to give to the Blessed Virgin Mary our hearts. So the theme of um, this 24th day is we can trust Our Lady with all we have, both material and spiritual. So imagine you're going away on a long journey and you're going to be away for some time and you need to entrust your goods to someone for them to keep it safe, for them to look after it. Imagine with our spiritual life, we cannot um, look after the goods that God has given to us on our own. We'll damage them, we'll ruin them, we'll forfeit them, and we'll even bury them underground like the wicked servant in the parable of the talents. We could all end up being like Judas, the traitor. So we can trust our lady. We shouldn't trust ourselves and say, you know what? God has given to me these gifts, these talents, these graces. You know, I'll look after them and I will bear most abundant fruit on my own accord. You know, I want to give these to Jesus. Of course. I want to bear fruit for Jesus, of course, we all do. But I believe I can do it on my own. Well, the lives of the saints teach us um, the lion, the devil who goes around like a roaring lion looking who he can devour. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll pay you a visit. <laughs> and um, you need the Immaculate Virgin to be there. So, um, there's one saint called Saint Luigi Orione, um, Don Luigi Orione, who died in 1940. This is very recent, and you know his body is actually incorrupt. Um, and he was a spiritual son of Saint John Bosco, you know, the new John Bosco, and he would entrust everything to the Blessed Virgin Mary. And she would always provide for him. He founded a congregation called the Sons of Divine Providence because he would just see how Divine Providence, he was always being helped. And it was the Blessed Virgin Mary who was helping him in each one of his endeavors. And even if um, you think of St. John Bosco himself, who I just mentioned, he had a dream. I don't know if you know that St. John Bosco had these prophetic dreams. And um, when he was still a, a boy, he had a dream. Um, I'll just synthesize it. He saw boys 
okay, that our Lord wanted to entrust to him. He wanted St. John Bosco to look after them. Um, but they were like wolves. They were like wild beasts. And St. John Bosco said, I, you know, I can't uh, manage, manage this. Um, and then he saw Our Lady, okay? And he saw Our Lady. And Jesus was telling him to entrust himself to Our Lady, to entrust this mission that he has given to him to Our Lady. And those wild beasts turned into lambs. <laughs> they turned into lambs. And the prophecy later on in his life came true. You know, he had a great devotion to Our Lady, in particular under the title of um, Mary um, Auxiliatrix, Help of Christians. Okay. And, you know, he founded the Salesians and also a, a female um, order, female congregation. And, you know, his, his life work was to look after the juvenile delinquents, you know, the young kind of unruly boys. And one of them became a great saint, Saint uh, Dominic Savio. I've already mentioned St. Luigi Orioni, who knew St. John Bosco when he was a boy. So that's proof, again, in the life of the saints that entrusting the mission that God has given to you to Our Lady, because the final aim is always Jesus, to present it to Jesus. At the end of our life, we say, Lord, you entrusted these talents, these gifts to me, this mission to me. Here, just like the parable of the talents, one was given five gifts. And he was, he multiplied it and got 10. Another was given, given two and he got four. You see, so um, to bear fruit at the end of our lives so that Jesus can say, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your Lord. So Jesus is always the final aim. And as I mentioned, God is calling each and every single one of us to become saints. So he has a mission, a particular mission for each and every one of us, from all eternity, before we came into existence, God had this mission for each one of us. And Our Lady, she knows exactly what that mission is. So how can we leave her to one side when she has all of the graces, all of the means of helping us to fulfill God's plan perfectly? She's there. She has these graces and abundance. So how can we leave her to one side and not make use of her and not acknowledge her as our mother and not trust her and entrust everything we have to her? And finally, um, one more example in the lives of the saints is, is Padre Pio, the great um, Padre Pio, who died in 1968. And that's very recent. You know, you even have video footage of Padre Pio. Um, I like I like there's one video footage where Padre Pio didn't really like the, the camera too much. So there's there's a man filming him and he gets his cord and he, he whacks he whacks it. <laughs> As if to say, what are you doing filming me? So you're are you okay? I'm not gonna whack the camera because I, I pushed okay on the on the on the option that came out and said you're gonna be recorded. So um, I won't give Benjamin a whack with my cord. But Padre Pio was just such an extraordinary saint. You know, he had the gift of bilocation, which mean, which meant that he could be in two places at once. He could do more than two things uh, at a time. So he could, he could be hearing confessions, you know, he could be bilocating and he could be praying rosaries. You know, and he, he received a, a mystical gift to be able to pray a hundred rosaries a day. You know, humanly speaking, that is impossible, you know, to pray a hundred rosaries a day. You know, that was a gift he was given by Our Lady. And, you know, he had the stigmata for 50 years and, you know, so many gifts. We could speak all day about Padre Pio. But he was saving a lot of souls. And, you know, the devil, the ancient serpent, who's mentioned in the beginning, Our Lady is the one who crushes his head together with her son. Um, the more someone is saving souls from going to hell, you know, the devil's going to come after them. And that's exactly what he did with Padre Pio. And he would actually physically attack and beat Padre Pio, beat him, physically attack him. 
So Padre Pio, when he was a boy, um, he, he considered himself to be a bit of a coward. You know, we, we, we can see Padre Pio saying, well, what a heroic, brave soul, you know. Uh, but when he was a boy, he considered himself to be a coward. And our Lord showed him, when he was a boy, a large monster and told Padre Pio, you know, he's going to have to fight that monster. And Padre Pio was afraid, you know, but our Lord assured him with his help, you know, he'll be victorious. And Padre Pio won, you know, a victory against the monster. However, the monster would always come to seek revenge throughout Padre Pio's life. But who was the one who was helping him throughout his life to be victorious? You know, I wish I had the actual quote. I'll just paraphrase. But Padre Pio basically says, the attacks of the demon against me are something terrible. But may God be praised because he has placed my salvation in the hands of our heavenly mother. And then he goes on to say, if it wasn't for our lady, you know, he wouldn't have been able to do the things that he did. And he said, all of the souls that were being brought to him in his confessional, because people would come to his confessional from all over the world. Okay, Padre Pio would be in the confessional for hours. You know, he said, it was Our Lady who was bringing him these souls. You know, and he had the mystical gift, mystical gift meaning it's not something that you can do on your own human ability. He had the mystical gift to even read into souls like a book. And he would tell these souls things about them that they didn't, they didn't tell him. You know, so there was a Freemason trying to hide it. Padre Pio would know that man's a Freemason. And then even people in confession, some of them, they'd have a hard time confessing their sins. And Padre Pio would tell them what their sins were. But all of this... Padre Pio said, all of the mystical gifts he received, he received it through the rosary. He received it through Our Lady. And he is a sublime example of devotion to the rosary. You know, uh, he had such a love for the rosary. The rosary was like his breath. It was like the air that he breathed. You know, this constant Hail Marys. You think of a hundred, a hundred rosaries a day. How many Hail Marys did he say? So... He entrusted himself to the Blessed Virgin Mary. And to just conclude in connecting all three of these saints together, there's one very interesting episode that happened in the life of Saint Luigi Orione, who I mentioned, Don Orione, or you could also call him Louis Orione, you know, um, the founder of the Sons of Divine Providence. You can also call them the Orionists. He gave a testimony of how at the canonization of St. John Bosco, remember that he knew St. John Bosco, he was there at the canonization of St. Luigi Orione.
Jeremiah is about Jeremiah. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, Father. Yes. So, yeah, I was just concluding um, by saying there was this episode um, where St. Luigi Orione um, was at the canonization of St. John Bosco, and he saw Padre Pio there in bilocation, and he gave this testimony of Pilate, Padre Pio bilocated. So the saints, you know, entrusted themselves to um, the Blessed Virgin Mary and she enabled them to bear fruit and to fulfill God's plan in their lives. Now let's look at the um, scripture reading. Jesus said, do not store up treasures for yourselves on earth where moths and woodworms destroy them and thieves can break in and steal, but store up treasures for yourselves in heaven where neither moths nor woodworms destroy them and thieves cannot break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. It's from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 6, verse 19 to 21. So, um, Benjamin was asking if I could speak a bit about the saints. Um, but before giving more um, stories on the saints, it's just important to, to ask ourselves, where is our heart? Some people ask the question, why is it difficult to give the heart to God? Why do I feel impeded? What is it that's blocking me from giving myself totally, giving the heart to God? Something is always, you know, holding back. You see, And this is where consecration to Our Lady and entrusting ourselves to, lead to Our Lady and giving everything to her can help us. Because imagine our heart is like a garden that has all of these weeds and it hasn't been taken care of and it's more like a jungle okay imagine our heart is like that and we we have to present our heart at the end of our lives to to jesus but our lady is like someone who enters that garden because we have allowed her to enter it and we have said that it is her property and we give it to her so that that garden is now Mary's garden. Okay. And she will transform it in a way that you could never have imagined. You could never have imagined. And it will be like a most beautiful garden, with the most beautiful flowers, you know, and so, we have to know what we love, you know, what is it we love? What is it that's in our heart? Do I love myself? Do I love money? Do I love power, fame, you know? And we have to purify our, our hearts, you know? God has to be in our heart, okay? And our lady is the one who will dethrone us from our hearts and she will place Jesus there. She will enthrone Jesus on our hearts and make him the king of our hearts. As I mentioned, consecration to Mary, the final aim is always Jesus, to give everything to Jesus, to belong better to Jesus, okay? For him to reign in our hearts, reign in our lives, for him to be our everything. 
for us to love Jesus in the blessed sacrament, in the Eucharist, with our whole heart. But we are weak creatures, sinners with concupiscence. You know, we have, we have defects and weaknesses and we need help to overcome these weaknesses and defects. We need help to fight the good fight and come out victorious. So she is the one who will transform that garden of the heart of the soul. And in the life of Saint Juan Diego, so remember I was saying every single one of us has a particular mission that God has entrusted to us for all eternity. Substantially, everyone's mission is the same. What do I mean by that? Substantially, the mission is he wants us all to be saints. Okay. But it's, he calls one person to be a saint as a priest, another person to be a saint as a married man with a family, with a wife, another man, another man to be a single and live as a saint, as a single person, like um, Saint Joseph, Giuseppe Muscati, who was a doctor who lived in the 20th century. You know, he was single, doctor, you know, chaste, heroic doctor, you know, so one person will live to 75, another person will, will, will live till 16. Someone might not see more than 40 years. So, you know, and, but substantially it's the same. Love God above all things with your whole heart and your neighbor as yourself. And to keep the commandments and live that commandment of love, love one another as I have loved you, okay? So um, some people might be entrusted with a very extraordinary mission. Um, like Saint Juan Diego, Saint Juan Diego, who was chosen to be the instrument, okay, not the cause, but the instrument of bringing more than 9 million souls to the faith. In Mexico. Okay, it was Our Lady that did that, but he was the instrument that was chosen. He was a, a widow in his in his fifties, okay. uh, who recently converted. You know, um, but he was entrusted this mission, and it's very, um, very beautiful the words that Our Lady said to him when she appeared in 1531. She said, hear and let it penetrate into your heart, my dear son. Let nothing discourage you, nothing depress you. Let nothing alter your heart or your countenance. Also, do not fear any illness or vexation, anxiety or pain. Am I not here who am your mother? Are you not under my shadow and protection? Am I not your fountain of life? Are you not in the folds of my mantle, in the crossing of my arms? Is there anything else that you need? And, you know, she explained to him that um, she wanted a shrine to be built, a temple, you know, where she can show the people um, her mercy, okay? Um, and it wasn't easy for him, you know, to, to, to fulfill um, God's plan. And, you know, um, yeah, I'm sure you all know the story, um, but there's just one episode I want to use as, 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 as a bit symbolic for um, what we've been saying thus far about Our Lady transforming and um, beautified, as it were, when the bishop wanted a sign and St. Juan Diego was to go up um, Mount Tepeyac. It was in December, winter time. And, you know, on the top of the mountain in winter in December, you're gonna find snow, you know, so. Um, but the sign was that there was gonna be flowers there. 
flowers. And he went, picked the flowers, um, and Our Lady, with her own hands, she, she arranged the flowers in his tilma, which was like, it's like a, it's like a um, it's kind of cheap, um, um, it almost looks like an apron um, that, you know, the Aztec men would wear. Um, and, you know, they could use it even to sleep in, you know, like a, like a blanket and carry things in. You know, so it was very handy. And so he went down the mountain carrying these flowers, went to meet the bishop. You know, the bishop was a bit um, skeptical of, of St. Juan Diego. And opened up his tilma and then the flowers fell to the ground and there on his tilma appeared um, the image of the lady who had been appearing to him. Okay, so just as our lady with her own hands was arranging those flowers, that is what she would do with our life if we give everything to her, we entrust it to her. So imagine if you're married and you have a family, you want to give everything to Jesus, okay? And you're gonna have to give an account for everything. So how have I done as a father of a family? I've got five children, my eldest son, my eldest daughter, then, you know, my second son, and then, you know, my second daughter, and then my, my third daughter, you know? I'm worried about them, what about their lives, you know? And then my work. You know, and how am I going to, my job, you know, I've got bills to pay. And what about this? And what about that? And what about, our, if you entrust your whole life to Our Lady, and in particular, your heart, because um, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And the aim is that God has to be our treasure. God has to be in our heart. But as I mentioned, with concupiscence, we tend towards pride and selfishness, okay? So we want to be the center of our heart. We don't want God to be the center of our heart. We want to be, we want to be the center. So we all have to fight against self-love and ego. And, you know, so, um, so we have to give our heart to God and um, make him be the center of our heart. We have to entrust all of these things because they're all connected to our life and our plan and our mission, the mission that God has for us. And a lot will depend on the heart, how we have loved, you see, how we have taken care of what he has given to us, okay, with love, to be like Jesus and to love like Jesus. Love one another as I have loved you. So just like, imagine someone with a family, you know, um, you've got so many things in your life. You've got marriage, you've got your children, you've got your, your career, you know, you've got even the gifts and talents that God has given to you, so many different aspects. Our Lady is the one who, just like what she did with St. Juan Diego, she will arrange everything. She will take care of everything. Just like, and just like how St. Juan Diego came down from the mountain, brought those flowers to the bishop, opened up his tilma, and there was Our Lady impressed on his tilma. At the end of your life, when God want you to give an account and we all will have to give an account he wants to see in your soul Jesus but the only way to have Jesus in your soul for you to be another image of Jesus is for you to be like Saint Juan Diego and have Mary not on the tilma but inside you inside you because I mentioned she is the secret of the saints. 
And she was the one who helped them to be transformed, as it were, into Jesus. St. Francis of Assisi, the founder of the Franciscans, he was called another Christ. He was called another Christ. He's the first saint in the history of the church that we know of that had the stigmata. And he was so like Jesus, you know. Um, and he became so little and small, St. Francis of Assisi. So, you know, for St. Francis, as I mentioned, for all the saints, Our Lady was their secret. But she helped them in, in, in a particular way. What I mean by that is, um, you know, St. Saint, Saint Dominic, you know, the great um, preacher who founded the order um, of preachers, the Dominicans, and also in his life, you know, I'll come back to what I'm going to say about St. Francis, but also in St. Dominic's life, when his mom, um, Donna Juana, was pregnant with St. Dominic, she was given a vision of a dog, a black and white dog that had a flaming torch in its mouth and it was going all around the world, spreading the light, putting out the darkness. And it was revealed to her that that was going to be her future son, Saint Dominic. He would do that with his preaching. Okay, and the Dominicans um, is a very Marian order. I hope they continue to be like that now, but they're a very Marian order. You know, they receive their habit, the white that they wear from Our Lady. And Our Lady gave to St. Dominic the rosary. And it was through the rosary that St. Dominic was successful in his preaching. And he had a great devotion to the Blessed Virgin. So you see again, the mission that God had for St. Dominic from all eternity, which was revealed to his mother, that her son was going to be that dog with a flaming torch in his mouth, putting out the darkness. And that rep represents also the heresies that he was going to defeat. It's through the rosary, through Our Lady. And we could even speak about St. Clair of Assisi when her mother was pregnant with her daughter, St. Clair. She was shown that her daughter was going to be a brilliant light. And her mother is actually um, blessed, blessed Ortolana. And her mother, in wanting that, that prophecy to come true, she named her daughter Claire. You know, Claire, like luminous, light, limpid. She named her daughter Claire, and she did become a brilliant light in the 13th century. St. Clara of Assisi, she spread virginity, chastity, purity all over Italy. So many young women, a lot of them from noble families, were leaving the world and embracing consecrated life, virginity. In a time when, you know, there was a lot of sensuality and, you know, you know, greed from, you know, wealth and so on. That is why our Lord Saint, Saint Francis of Assisi, the poor man of Assisi. And to go back to what I was saying about Saint Francis, you know, his mother, um, when she was pregnant with Saint Francis and it was time for her to give birth, Saint Francis's father was away. You know, he was a, a, a very famous cloth merchant. She wanted to imitate Our Lady. And this is another aspect of consecration to Mary and how we can be helped in our being conformed to Christ and having Christ, the image of Christ painted as it were in our soul is through imitating the Blessed Virgin Mary, imitating her humility, imitating her charity, imitating her obedience, her purity all the other virtues you know, I mentioned. You know, because she will help us to be like Jesus. Jesus said, imitate me for I am meek and humble of heart. 
We need help in imitating Christ and the Blessed Virgin Mary will give us these graces. But Jesus would like us to look at his mother because she is a model of perfection. She is the Immaculate Conception, okay? And we are all called to have a heart that is pure, a heart that is clean. Yes, we are sinners with concupiscence, but God is calling each one of us to be without stain. Okay, Jesus said, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. God is not going to ask anything of us that is impossible. So God is saying to us, be perfect. Okay. And God doesn't want us to arrive at our judgment with a heart that is dirty, filthy, and, you know, imagine you have a white garment on and someone just covers it with the black paint, you know, um, or mud. Okay. God doesn't want our heart to be like that. And let us remember Jesus said, blessed are the clean of heart, blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. So imitating the Blessed Virgin Mary can help us to be conformed to Christ through the Blessed Virgin Mary. So St. Francis's mother wanted to imitate the poverty of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So when her hour had arrived, when it was time for her to give birth, she went down into a stable. She went down into a stable and gave birth to St. Francis in a stable, wanting to imitate Our Lady. See, you see a lot of times, um, some of these great saints, the seed of their, 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 um, their mission, you can actually find a lot of times in the mother, because St. Dominic's mother, when St. Dominic was a boy, she would be recounting to him um, the episodes of our Lord's life. So you can almost see the initial seeds of the rosary in meditating on the mysteries of Jesus, his life, Jesus's life. St. Dominic's mother was already placing this, as it were, in her tender boy's, her tender child's heart by telling him about the mysteries of our Lord, his life, you see. So the initial stages of the rosary can even find it in St. Dominic's mother. Okay, and later on, the Queen of Heaven, our Heavenly Mother, gave to him the rose. So St. Francis of Assisi, who lived that Franciscan poverty, becoming like another Christ, you know, the poor man of Assisi, can be found in his mother, who, you know, got things started, let's say, <laughs> giving birth to him in the state. And St. Francis of Assisi was the first saint, he's the one who invented the Christmas crib, you see, he's the one who invented the Christmas crib there in Gretchen, where with the permission um, of the church, he had uh, a, a kind of, a, uh, he was able to get a, a, a live animals in, 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 a, um, in a stable, basically what was like a stable and have a mass there, you know, and anyway. But St. Francis of Assisi, who had, you know, worldly ambition, you know, to be, to be a knight, you know. Um, so if someone, if someone was, was a knight, they would become part of the nobility. Okay, so he had this uh, worldly ambition. But anyway, I, I'm not going to go too much into the um, story of St. Francis of Assisi because... Um, I have to keep an eye on the time. But anyway, he was being called to this Franciscan poverty. Okay. A complete change. And in a church known as the Port Siuncula, which means little portion, tiny little church, little humble church, it is there that he was able to conceive, as it were, this Franciscan life. And for the Franciscans, 
That church, known as the Port Sincola, was a little church, little tiny church. The Franciscans call that the mystical womb of Mary. It's like a womb. And St. Francis in that church prayed night and day, you know, and he, he would sing hymns to Our Lady in a language that's unknown, <laughs> you know, and it's there in that little church, in the womb of Mary, in the mystical womb of Mary, that he became so small. And that's the secret of the greatness of St. Francis of Assisi, that humility. Remember in the gospel when some of the apostles were, they were, they were the apostles were discussing among themselves, who is the greater? And we'll look at this a little bit tomorrow. And Jesus placed in their midst a little child. He said, whoever humbles himself as this little child, he is the greater. You see? So that is why St. Francis is so great. Because of that littleness. He became like a little child in the womb of his mother. Imagine. Imagine there are three levels of littleness. One level is to be like a little toddler learning how to walk, holding their mother's hand. That's, that's very little. But you can become even smaller than that. You can be like a little baby in your mother's arms, being nourished by her milk. That's even smaller than a little toddler walking, holding their mother's hand. But you can become even smaller than a little baby in the mother's arms and be in the womb, <laughs> be in the womb of your mother. And that was St. Francis of Assisi in the Port Siuncola. And he was transformed in the mystical womb of Mary and he came out as another Christ. So that way of littleness, which St. Therese of Lisieux also teaches us, her middle name was Francois. Fran, um, I don't know how to say it in French. Um, Franz, Francis. There's different ways of saying the female version of Francis in the name, but anyway, in Italian it's Francesca. <laughs> but um, her middle name was taken after Saint Francis of Assisi, and her parents were third order Franciscans. Her parents are actually saints. So remember what I was saying: everyone's called to be a saint, and there are. Couples who are saints, married couples who are saints, so the parents of Saint Therese are saints. Okay, so we're all called to be saints in whatever state of life God has chosen for us. I mentioned Saint Joseph Moscati, the doctor who was single. You know, and the Zeli um, and Louis are saints as the parents of um, Saint Therese. Okay. So she, with her little way, is also showing that secret of greatness, which is not really a secret because our Lord revealed it in the gospel. If you want to be great, you've got to be small. Okay. Pope St. Pius X, one of the greatest popes in the history of the church. Yeah, he was a third order Franciscan. I have the kind of wave the Franciscan flag, don't, don't mind me if I do that. But um, He described Saint Therese as being one of the greatest saints of modern times. Can you believe that? Why is she so great? Look, she's the saint teaching us the little way, littleness, and she was, she became like a little child. So, and she, you know, if you know about the, the Our Lady of the Smile and the, the miracle she received from Our Lady, and she said that she would tell Our Lady everything. She said she would tell, she tells Our Lady everything. Imagine a little child who's always telling their mother everything, always asking their mother everything. Mommy, why is that like that? Sometimes I walk down the street and a child will say, Mommy, why is that man dressed like that? <laughs> You know, so that's how we have to be with Our Lady. Ask her everything. 
speak to her like a child does to their mother because she loves you all very much and she wants to help you in every moment. She wants to help you in every moment. You know, I remember when I was when I was a child, my mother always wanted to help me with everything. And then, you know, when you get bigger, you say, Mom, I can do it by myself. In the spiritual life, that's not how we're that's not how we should be in the spiritual life. You have to be little and allow your mother to help you with everything. In the spiritual life, you know, in 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 real life, you know, obviously you've got to <laughs> got to grow up but in the spiritual life we have to always remain small so saint francis was able to fulfill his plan and mission through the blessed virgin saint dominic was able to fulfill god's plan and mission through the blessed virgin saint claire of assisi through the blessed virgin saint giuseppe mostati through the blessed virgin Saint Therese of Lisieux through the Blessed Virgin. And all the saints I've mentioned, Pope Saint Pius X, Louis and Zeligory, you will find there in their lives, the Blessed Virgin Mary. So let us open up our hearts to her. Let us entrust everything to her and give to her those flowers like Saint Juan Diego for her to arrange and organize as she wishes, as she pleases. Let us be her humble instruments and docile servants. And let's look at a reading from St. Louis de Montfort. Rejoice and be glad. Here is a secret which I am revealing to you, a secret unknown to most Christians, even the most devout. Do not commit the gold of your charity, the silver of your purity, to a threadbare sack or a battered old chest, or the waters of heavenly grace, or the wines of your merits and virtues to a tainted and fetid cask, such as you are. Otherwise, you will be robbed by thieving devils that are on the lookout day and night, waiting for a favorable opportunity to plunder. If you do so, all those pure gifts from God will be spoiled by the unwholesome presence of self-love, inordinate self-reliance and self-will. Pour into the bosom and the heart of Mary all of your treasures, all of your graces and all of your virtues. She is a spiritual vessel. She is a vessel of honor. And she is a marvelous vessel of devotion. Since God himself has been shut up in person with all his perfections in that vessel, it has become altogether spiritual and the spiritual abode of the most spiritual souls. It has become honorable and the throne of honor for the grandest price princes of eternity. It has become wonderful in devotion and a dwelling, the most illustrious for sweetness, for graces and for virtues. It has become rich as a house of gold, strong as a tower of David and pure as a tower of ivory. That's from St. Louis de Montfort. So, um, I was saying we could try to give everything to Jesus on our own, but we'll find that um, we find the presence of St. Louis de Montfort says, the unwholesome presence of self-love, inordinate self-reliance and self-will. And we will all find that struggle there in the heart. We will find it difficult to give the heart so we need help and God has given the Blessed Virgin Mary to us to help us, to help us. And the closer we get to our lady, the more we love our lady, 
the more the door of our heart will be opened wide to our lady so that she can enter and do her work. She has a role. She has a job to do. We have to allow her to do that. Um, so let us trust let us not look at our lady with some type of suspicion and say giving to our lady is that taking away from Jesus ain't I meant to be given to Jesus so why am I giving to our lady okay you are entrusting everything to our lady so that she can take everything that you have and transform it to how God wants it to be so that you can present it to Jesus through her transforming it, through her enabling you to bring fruit. Okay. And um, so as I mentioned, you know, as a Franciscan, I can share with you some of my Franciscan life in the sense that I can mention some Franciscan saints. Um, and, you know, we were very blessed in the, the um, 1600s to have two very heroic victim souls one of them lived in the 1500s and 1600s. She's a um, venerable, venerable Mother Mariana de Jesus Torres, a Spanish conceptionist nun. Um, the conceptionists are part of the Franciscan order. Um, and the other lived in the 1600s and 1700s. She's called Saint Veronica Giuliani, St. Veronica Giuliani, who was basically like a female Padre Pio, long before Padre Pio existed. She had the stigmata, um, but yeah, she's, she's like a um, female Padre Pio. And, you know, both of them had a very particular mission. Blessed, I mean, sorry, Venerable Mother Mariana, she was entrusted with um, realizing, having made a statue, to make a statue of Our Lady. Okay, Our Lady appeared to her and said that she wanted a statue. Okay, and um, Mother Mariana actually took the actual measurements of the Blessed Virgin Mary. She took a Franciscan cord. So I mentioned the Franciscan cord that you know I'm not gonna hit the camera with. She took the Franciscan cord and measured Our Lady with the cord. You know, she held it. Our Lady took the top of the cord and it, it miraculously grew to where Our Lady was, you know, so Our Lady could measure. She could have the exact measurement. Um, you know, but she had a bit of difficulty in, in realizing this, 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 this project, you know, to have the, the, this statue made. And, um, Mother Mariana was a bit, um, a bit the cause in, in delaying having the statue made because, you know, she was a bit worried that, you know, doubted a little bit, you know, whether what, what about the apparitions itself. And she was worried about the um, the, the native people of, of Ecuador and Quito that they might, um, they might take the statue as being some, um, uh, they might be practicing some type of uh, idolatry. She just, filled her minds with these different worries. And, you know, let us remember what Our Lady said to St. Juan Diego, you know. Do not fear, you know, um, anyway. So Our Lady actually reproached Mother Mariana for taking long. It actually took Mother Mariana 10 years, 10 years to have that statue done. So, uh, you know, for us who at times we might be a bit slow in doing the will of God, uh, 
Mother Mariana from being a bit of a consolation for us, I say. And, and Our Lady even reproached her, I say. But anyway, you know, she dispelled all the fears and, you know. Um, and. That, um, that statue was miraculously done with the help. Um, she got a, she got a very skilled and pious sculptor to do it who started the work. Um, he went to Spain to get some particular colors to finish it. But what in his absence, the statue was miraculously completed by the three archangels. Saint Michael, Saint Gabriel, and Saint Raphael the Archangel, with the help of Saint Francis of Assisi. Saint Francis of Assisi placed his cord around um, the statue. And when the artist came back from Spain, saw the statue, he said, This is not my work. You know, and Our Lady had actually appeared and she walked into the statue singing her Magnificat. She sang the Magnificat from inside the statue. Okay. And that is what Our Lady wants to do in our life. She wants to enter into us and she wants to sing her Magnificat. My soul glorifies the Lord. She wants to sing that. It'll be our victory. Okay, it'll be our hymn of victory. But Our Lady has to sing that from within us. Okay, so we have to let her in. But Mother Mariana also had the mission of suffering for the 20th century and our times as well. Um, so I don't know if some of you are aware of the apparitions of Our Lady of Good Success in Quito, Ecuador. Um, you know, in the 16th and uh, 17th century, so in the 1500s started it. I mean, the 1600s as well, but 1500s, you've got to remember, not too long after um, Guadalupe. So Our Lady appeared to St. Juan Diego in 1531. But it was in the, uh, the, the latter part of the uh, 1500s, she appeared to Mother Mariana. And she, she showed Mother Mariana our times, the 20th century and beyond. And what Mother Mariana saw was so shocking, you know, she actually died. <laughs> so, so shocking, right? Um, well, she, she was asked to be a victim soul for our times. You know, she heard the voice of God the Father. She saw our Lord, and there were three swords hanging above our Lord's head. On one sword was written, I will punish heresy. On another sword was written, I will punish blasphemy. And on another sword was written, I will punish impurity. Okay. And God wanted Mother Mariana to be a victim soul for these times. And the swords plunged into her. She died, but she came back to life again. She actually died three times. So she suffered for our times. And she saw so many things. Um, so remember, this is, this is in the 1500s, 15 and 1600s. And a lot of the prophecies that she saw came true. So she saw that there will hardly be any innocence in children. We're seeing that now. There will hardly be any modesty in women. We're seeing that now. You go out in the summertime, I'm going to say it very frankly, the women are dressing like prostitutes. Okay? But anyway. And she showed her how the sacraments would come under attack. Marriage, the Eucharist, with many sacrileges, people taking the sacred host and profaning it. Okay. She showed her what will happen to priests, 
a lot of priests will lose their way and so on. But anyway, she suffered for these times. But it was Our Lady who helped her. It was Our Lady who helped her. And a similar thing with St. Veronica Giuliani. Jesus said to St. Veronica Giuliani, who was a Capuchin Franciscan nun. I said she was like a female Padre Pio, because Padre Pio was a Capuchin Franciscan. There were three branches of the Franciscan order. And one of them was the Capuchins. So she was a Capuchin nun. Jesus said to St. Veronica Giuliani, your life and your writings will be used for the defense of the faith and the triumph of love. Your life and your writings will be used for the defense of the faith and the triumph of love. And we are living in these times of apostasy, great apostasy. Apostasy meaning loss of faith. People have abandoned the faith. Abandon the faith. Okay. And um, people even deny that hell exists and that there are souls in hell. Well, St. Veronica Giuliani saw souls falling into hell like rain, believe it or not. Like rain. And she she had such a great love for souls. She wanted to save so many souls. She wanted to be like a barricade, blocking hell, blocking souls from going to hell. She wanted to be like someone saying, no, you're not going. I'm, I'm in the way. No one's going to hell. But she had to pay a price to save so many souls. Okay. And... She received um, a very sublime mystical gift that, from what we know, hasn't happened to any saint in the history of the church. What it was was that St. Veronica, wanting to suffer so much to save souls, she was actually allowed to go to hell to suffer. Can you believe that? She had a guardian angel there. She went to hell to suffer. But while she was in hell suffering, Our Lady actually took her place in the monastery. So St. Veronica Giuliani was the mother abbess, the mother superior. Okay. And the second in charge in the monastery, the vicar, um, who, who's a blessed, blessed Florida Cheroli, she knew what was going on. She knew that there were times when St. Veronica would be in hell suffering. And while she was there suffering, the person who was the mother superior was actually Mary in person. So one of the nuns, you know, kind of asked the vicar, and said, well, well, not asked, she, she made a comment, she said, there's something very special about Mother Veronica. She's, when she speaks, you know, she has such a celestial voice. And it's so, and then the vicar actually revealed what, what was happening. She said, it's not Mother Veronica, it's Mary. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Being physically substituted by Our Lady. So sometimes Our Lady would actually physically take her place. I spoke about... Um, when Our Lady appeared to St. Juan Diego with her own hands, she arranged the flowers. Well, in the life of St. Veronica, Our Lady actually physically took her place. So um, that's never happened to another saint in the history of the church before. So St. Veronica Giuliani um, offered herself to save so many souls, you know, and of all the, the penances that she did, the hardest thing for her to do was to write her diary. Believe it or not. So she would do some, some penances that we couldn't repeat, you know, to make up for, to do reparation for all of the blasphemies. 
she would tie like a, a large cylinder block of cement around her tongue. <laughs> you know, like we couldn't do that. But she would do some, 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 um, you know, some penances that, um, you know, um, we couldn't, we, we, we couldn't even think of. And we, we can't imitate everything that the saints do. You know, that has to be said. Um, but the hardest thing for her was to write her diary because under obedience, she was told to write her diary, but she would have to reveal all of these mystical things that were happening to her. And she was very humble. She didn't want anyone to know. So that for her was a penance. But the content of that diary was going to be so beneficial for the world and for the church. She actually wrote 22,000 pages. I'll repeat that. 22,000 pages. Can you believe it? And they're still translating her diary. And the devil tried to do everything he could to stop her from writing that diary. Now, as I mentioned, the devil, I don't know if, 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 if the computer's gonna, <laughs> gonna pack up or anything like that. But anyway, he tried to do everything he could to stop her from writing that diary. You know, and there's actually um, a, a very good film documentary that's been made of St. Veronica Giuliani. It's in Italian, but it has English subtitles. It's called, um, oh, it's gone out of my head now. It's called something like The Awakening of a Giant. The Awakening of a Giant, St. Veronica Giuliani. Um, film documentary. So if anyone's interested in learning more about her life, there's an interesting scene where she's writing her diary and then the devil comes into her room and tries to, you know, discourage her and scare her. And then she starts saying the Hail Mary. She starts saying the Hail Mary. And then she overcomes the devil with the Hail Mary and is able to continue to write her diary. Okay, so she entrusted everything to Our Lady. She herself said that Our Lady guided her in everything. I remember what I was saying about um, being like a child whose mother wants to help them in everything and we have to allow our mother to help us in everything, our spiritual mother, the Blessed Virgin Mary. St. Veronica was so humble she felt herself in need of Mary in everything, in everything. Remember Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. Okay. Well, our lady has been given to us by Jesus. Okay. And the graces of God. Okay. Which come to us from the Father, through the Son, okay, distributed through the Holy Spirit and the Blessed Virgin Mary, who is mediatrix of all graces. So the graces come from the Father, pass through the humanity of Christ, and is distributed to us through the Holy Spirit, together with the Blessed Virgin Mary, who is the mediatrix of all graces and the spouse of the Holy Spirit. She is helping us. So to recognize we can do nothing on our own, okay, we will live that through this consecration to Mary. But St. Veronica was so humble, she felt she needed Our Lady's help in everything. And she herself says, Our Lady helped her with everything, even the little things. And Our Lady was guiding her. And when she was a, 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 the mother, when she became the mother abbess, she gave the rule of St. Clair and the keys of the convent to Our Lady and entrusted it to her and said, Here, you are the Mother Superior. That was her humility to say, I can't do it. You have to be the Mother Superior. And similar thing, um, you know, with um, Our Lady of Good Success, that miraculous statue, Our Lady wanted it to be placed in the choir loft on the 
chair of the abbess, the mother superior's chair, because she wanted to govern that monastery until the end of time. And she had the crozier, the crozier, okay, you know, like the, um, um, like the bishop has his um, pastoral, you know, um, um, the, the, the mother abbess has the crozier. So sign of her, you know, power as abbess and her authority. So Our Lady had that because she wanted to be the mother abbess. That's what she told Mother Mariana, Venerable Mother Mariana. But St. Veronica Giuliani herself acknowledged that. I can't do it. Let it be you. And she entrusted everything to the Blessed Virgin Mary and everything worked out. So, just to conclude again with St. Louis de Montfort, you know, let us pour into the bosom and the heart of Mary all your treasures, all your graces, and all your virtues. She is a spiritual vessel. She is a vessel of honor, and she is a marvelous vessel of devotion. Okay. Now, um, let's go to our resolution. Let us ask God for the grace to give everything to him through Mary. Let us ask for this grace. And, um, I'll give you all a blessing. Behind me, I actually have an image of Our Lady of Good Success. Um, you probably can't see it because Our Lady of Good Success. Okay, so this is the Crozier. This is the she's the Mother Abbess. Okay, she's the Mother Abbess. And let us, she's the mother superior. So let her become the mother superior of our life. <laughs> okay, now let's hope. Okay. Let her become the mother superior of our life. <laughs> okay, so I'll give you all a uh, Blessing. Hello. Hello, Father. Okay. So I'll conclude with giving you all a blessing through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, St. Francis of Assisi, St. Clare of Assisi, St. Padre Pio, St. Maximilian Mary Colbert, St. Veronica Giuliani and Venerable Mother Mariana to the Feast Torres. May Almighty God bless you, with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.